It's four minutes past. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Isabel Mendoza. I'm the Global Plan Council Communications Officer, and welcome to the second webinar of the Plan Science Based Solutions to Tackle Climate Change series, leading up to the 2023 UN Climate Change Conference that will happen in Dubai by the end of this month. So, today's webinar will be moderated again by Liana Acevedo Siaka, a board member, board member of the GPC and researcher at the Michigan State University. So Liana, the floor is yours. I will be here behind the scenes. Which is exciting. Um, so as Isabel mentioned, um, thank you so much for joining us for our webinar, Agriculture in a Changing Climate. This is our second webinar of the larger Plant Science-Based Solutions to Climate Change webinar series that's hosted by the Global Plant Council. Um, to learn more about the Global Plant Council and some of the different activities and initiatives that um, we're part of, please feel free to visit the Global Plant Council website, which we will share in the chat box shortly. And as a little bit of background information for those who might not be so familiar with the Global Plant Council, um, the GPC was founded in 2009 to provide a body that can speak on behalf of the plant science community with a strong single voice to the policy and decision making arena to promote plant science research and teaching around the world. And so today, really briefly, some housekeeping. Um, this pres these presentations will be recorded, just so you know. Um, and today we will be hearing two talks from panelists, Dr. Lisa Ainsworth and Dr. Amanda Cavanaugh. So each speaker will present about a 20 minute talk. Um, we'll be taking questions after both the talks wrap up. So please feel free to submit any questions through the Q&A box that's provided through Zoom. And then at the end, we will go through all of that. Um, questions can be general or they can be directed to specific panelists as well. And with that, let's get started. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lisa Ainsworth. Lisa Ainsworth is a plant physiologist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture based at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and she specializes in understanding plant responses to climate change, pioneering the use of biochemical and genomic tools, notably through the Soy Free Air Carbon Enrichment, or Soy Face, project. Her research reveals the significant impact of rising carbon dioxide and ground-level ozone on crop production. Beyond her scientific contributions, she actively promotes science outreach and engagement and has earned prestigious awards, including becoming a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2020. And so with that, I will pass this over to Lisa and we're all very excited to hear your talk. Thank you, Liana. I'll share my screen. Okay, hopefully that's clear and everyone can see. So thank you very much for the invitation um, to do this today with Amanda. It's really a pleasure um, and I'm excited to talk about our work. So I'm gonna to briefly talk about agriculture in a changing climate. Um, and I'll just, I'll start with this slide. So this is a slide that is um, um, an image from the um, US Geological Survey. And in this image, the croplands are highlighted in bright green. And so what you see here is that approximately 12.6% of the global land surface is covered by croplands. And so that's over 1.8 billion hectares. So when we're thinking about the challenge of adaptation, this is the scale of the challenge. And, and to understand um, how we need to adapt uh, agriculture to climate change, we first need to think about how the climate has changed. And so these are two figures from um, a paper that was published in Science a few years ago. And the figure shows the 1980 to 2008, um, sorry, this the, the figure is showing you a map that shows you the trend, the 29 year trend from 1980 to, two, um, to 2008, relative to the historical standard deviation. And so places that are much warmer have a brighter color here. And so relative to the standard deviation, they're much warmer. Places that are blue are cooler. Um, um, and so what you can see is that many of the regions where we grow crops are much warmer um, today than what they were relative to 1960 to, to the year 2000. There are some notable um, changes or, or differences from that, and notably the Midwestern part of the United States where we grow a lot of crops is actually a little bit cooler. The 1960 to 2000 average is cooler than the 1980 to 2008 um, average. Um, and so the, the trends for precipitation are shown in the lower map. And what you can see is there are um, notable regions that are drier 
Um, and um, but that isn't consistent across all of the regions. Um, and so the trends for climate in terms of temperature and precipitation uh, vary across the globe in our growing um, regions. So this study um, then asked what effect these trends in temperature and precipitation have had on crop yields. And so this is the da data showing you uh, the trends from wheat. Um, and so uh, wheat yields um, over the whole globe have decreased by about 10% based on the increase in temperature across the globe. Um, there's variation, as much as 15% decreases were seen in Russia. Um, and in the United States, where we haven't had the same warming trend as other growing regions, wheat yields have not, um, have not decreased uh, due, to, due to rising temperatures. Um, the effects of precipitation are less um, notable, and those are the blue um, dots that you're seeing here. And so on average, there really hasn't been an impact of changing precipitation over the last 30 years or so on wheat yields. Uh, these are the graphs for maize and rice shown here. And so these bar charts show similar estimates of climate effects on maize and rice. So recent changes in, um, in climate have decreased maize or corn yields by about 5% on average. There's been little impact here on rice shown in these, in these bar charts. And so the key takeaway here is that the impact of recent climate impacts on crops depends on the region and it depends on the crop. And so this is important when we're thinking about adapting agriculture as a whole to climate change. And of course, the increases in temperature and the changes in precipitation are largely driven by changes in the greenhouse gas composition of the atmosphere. Um, and so this is a figure from NASA that shows the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere from 800,000 years ago to today. So NASA titled this figure, the relentless rise of carbon dioxide. And so you can see for at least 800,000 years before the industrial revolution, carbon dioxide concentrations were below about 280 to 300 parts per million. Um, in 2002, the global average CO2 concentration set a new record um, exceeding 417 parts per million. Um, and so, Right now, we're adding um, just over two parts per million CO2 to the atmosphere every year um, and um, that results from our um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so by the middle of the century, we'll probably exceed 500 to 550 parts per million. And by the end of the century, um, unless there are solutions that draw down CO2 from the atmosphere, we'll be at 600 to 700 parts per million. Another gas that has increased since the Industrial Revolution is ozone. Um, and ozone is an, um, an atmospheric pollutant. It's a, it's a component of photochemical smog. Um, our best pre-industrial atmospheric um, concentration estimates of ozone were made in Paris. Um, and these estimate that ozone concentrations were around 11 um, to 15 parts per billion in the pre-industrial period. And so concentrations, uh, again, have, have increased um, linearly. And, and in some parts of the world, in Europe and in some parts of North America, these have leveled off in recent years. But in many parts of the world, ozone concentrations continue to increase um, linearly. And like CO2, ozone is a greenhouse gas. And so it also is a heat trapping gas that is contributing to global warming. Both ozone and CO2 have direct um, impacts on plant um, physiology and plant performance. And they share a diffusion pathway. And so they both diffuse to, into leaves through the stomata. Um, and with more CO2, you have an increase in photosynthesis um, in C3 plants. Um, rising CO2 also leads to a decrease in stomatal conductance and it improves yields. By contrast, ozone is um, a damaging air pollutant. And so ozone decreases photosynthesis, it accelerates the process of senescence, and it largely decreases yields. Um, but as we saw before, both of these gases are increasing in combination in the atmosphere. Um, and both the CO2 and ozone cycles have greatly intensified over the past 100 years. And so today, terrestrial ecosystems take up nearly one third of the carbon dioxide that's emitted from anthropogenic sources and about a fifth of the tropospheric ozone that's produced by chemical production. Um, in recent decades, rising CO2 has likely contributed to the greening of the planet, while ozone has reduced terrestrial net prim primary productivity. 
So the capacity of ecosystems to continue to filter atmospheric pollutants has very important consequences for future climate and provisioning of ecosystem goods and services, and is particularly important um, in agriculture as well. And so these changes in atmospheric composition have added a, a new dimension to crop production, and they provide new challenges and opportunities for agriculture. And so while temperature and precipitation and nutrients and pests and diseases have challenged agriculture since its inception, we are seeing that these changes are pushing agricultural systems past what's been previously experienced. And um, understanding how crop responses to rise, how crops respond to rising CO2 and ozone um, and how they interact with these other changes is key to accelerating adaptation of crops to climate change. With that in mind, about 20 years ago, or over 20 years ago now, the soy face experiment that Liana mentioned was started. And so face stands for free air concentration enrichment. And this is an aerial image that's showing you part of a 32 hectare field where crops are growing in ambient or elevated ozone or CO2 concentrations in the field under fully open air conditions. So the octagons that you see here in the field are our experimental plots for um, gas manipulation. And if we zoom in on one of those plots, you can see what the experiment looks like. Um, there's an octagon that's surrounded by gray pipes that are perforated um, and have small holes in them. Um, and um, in the center of the ring, we have, um, uh, um, we're collecting a sample of air to monitor the CO2 or the ozone concentration. And also located towards the center of the ring, we have um, um, a weather station where we're measuring the wind speed um, and the wind direction um, in real time. So this information is sent to a computer that controls um, this manifold box. So if the wind is coming from the direction of the yellow arrow, then the size of the, um, then this manifold controls that gas is released from where these pipes are read here. So then the wind carries the gases across the plot so that we're fumigating to a target concentration. And in the case of soy phase, our target concentration for CO2 is about 600 parts per million. Um, and for ozone has been anywhere from about double ambient concentrations to a target of 100 parts per billion. So the fumigation, um, the phase system has been running since the early 2000s, and it provides an accurate and homogenous fumigation. Um, and so the, the, the fumigation data for the last 23 years has been recently published in scientific data. And for CO2, we're within 20% of our target concentration for over 90% of the time. And for ozone, we're within that concentration for over 80% of the time um, in most years. And this infrared image shows you um, that the fumigation is, is largely homogenous. This was an image taken by Andrew Leakey. Um, and when you grow plants in elevated CO2, they tend to close their stomata, which reduces evaporative cooling, leading to a warmer plot and so that or, or a warmer plant. And that's what you see in this image. The soy face experiments um, have been part of global networks of face experiments for both CO2 and for ozone. And so what you can see in these maps is the location of the face facilities that have um, looked at elevated CO2. Those are the white dots in this upper map. Um, and the red dots show you the open air ozone experiments um, that have been um, done around the world. And so you, what we've done is we we um, have synthesized how um, crops respond to, to rising CO2 to a concentration around 550 to 600 parts per million, and also to increased ozone concentrations. And that's what's shown in these plots. And so for the major crops, wheat, rice, legumes, root crops, um, what you can see is the mean proportionate yield response. So for wheat, it's about um, an, um, a 16% increase in yield. The minimum response is really no change at all. And then there are some lines that are capable of increasing their yields by almost 50% in elevated CO2. And this is true for almost every crop that we studied. There is significant variation um, in the mean response and in the maximum, between the maximum and minimum response to elevated CO2. The same is true for ozone. And so what's shown here is the, ch the um, change in yield uh, per um, ppm hour of ozone or change in biomass. And what you can see is that um, snap bean and rice and wheat and soybean all have significant reductions in yield per unit increase in ozone concentration. But there is significant variation around that mean. 
And one of the things that causes variation in the response of crops to rising CO2 and ozone is genetic variation. And that's what we're particularly interested in studying at the soy face experiment. And so I'm just going to walk through a couple of um, example experiments that we've done to try to take advantage of that genetic variation to adapt crops to atmospheric change. Um, and so on the picture on the left that you're seeing, this is an image of, um, of soybeans, and we have 200 um, 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 recombinant inbred lines that we've been screening at elevated CO2 at soy face in this experiment. And then I'll walk through today our work in elevated ozone, where we've screened um, over 200 inbred lines of maize and about 100 um, hybrid lines of maize at elevated ozone concentrations. One of the key things that we found in these experiments is that elevated ozone accelerates senescence. And so in these experiments, we grew a number of different hybrid lines, in this case, under elevated ozone concentrations. And our target was 100 parts per billion. What I'm showing you here is flag leaf photosynthesis, so that's A on the y-axis, um, over time. And so this is days after anthesis. And so we're measuring the leaf that's subtending the ear in this case. The open symbols are ambient ozone. The closed symbols are elevated ozone. Um, and so what's clear for almost all of these lines is that elevated ozone accelerates this natural process of senescence that you see as leaves are aging. But the degree to which if we can if we integrate underneath these curves, we can test the degree to which um, senescence is accelerated. Um, and that varies from as little as 13 percent to as much as about 44 percent in some of these um, diverse lines. And that change in photosynthesis is also um, correlated with the change in yield. And so seed yield in, the seed yield response to elevated ozone correlates to the photosynthetic response. And so this gave us, um, um, this made us want to study photosynthesis in more detail in these hybrid lines of maize. And in fact, we created a half dial L population to test whether the heritability of photosynthesis was altered in elevated ozone. And so in this experiment, we crossed um, 10 lines by each other and we created a half dial L population, which we then screened in the field under elevated ozone concentrations. And we measured photosynthesis again um, on the leaf subtending the ear. Again, the open symbols are ambient ozone, the closed symbols are elevated ozone. And you can see that there's a high degree of variation. Some lines really don't show any change in photosynthesis in elevated ozone. And some have photosynthesis that's reduced by more than 50%. When we test the um, heritability of this trait, it actually increased in elevated ozone. And we looked at the genetic correlation amongst photosynthetic traits in both ambient and elevated ozone as well. Um, and what we found was that elevated ozone um, can alter the genetic correlation between key traits. And so if we look at the cyan dots here, the different circles are two different years of this study. Um, there's a very strong, almost 100% genetic correlation between stomatal conductance and the intracellular CO2 concentration relative to the atmospheric CO2 concentration. And this is what we would expect. And this is the case in ambient CO2. However, the correlation falls off completely in elevated ozone. Um, I'm sorry, this is an ambient ozone. The, um, the y-axis here is elevated ozone. And so we have a much lower correlation between conductance and intracellular CO2 concentration in elevated ozone. So ozone is causing a fundamental shift in this relationship between traits and the involvement of additional genetic factors in controlling the phenotype um, must be happening. And so if we plot this out in a different way, this is just showing you the, the intracellular CO2 concentration versus atmospheric CO2 concentration. And this is the stomatal conductance or the ease of which CO, um, CO2 is entering the leaves. Um, what I'm showing you here is in, this is what's happening in ambient ozone. These are our 45 um, lines from the half dial L population. Lines that have HP301 or NC338 um, are shown in orange and blue um, in this graph. And so these are two years of the study showing this relationship. If we then plot what happens at elevated ozone, what you can see is that the lines that have genetic um, material from HP301 or NC338 fall off of this one-to-one -one or fall off of this linear slope in the relationship between conductance and CICA. And so um, 
And so these two lines are particularly sensitive to ozone and they and they alter the relationship between stomatal conductance um, and the intracellular CO2 concentration. We've also looked at the transcriptional response to ozone in um, inbred lines, including these lines that were particularly sensitive. And again, we find strong genetic variation in the response. And so B73 is our most was our most tolerant line in terms of its transcriptional response. Um, although the di direction in which the, the transcripts are changing, um, the, um, the degree to which they're changing is muted in B73. Um, in this graph, the the this graph is um, showing you the 998 genes here in orange in this um, in this sector that are only changing in one genotype, and that's an NC338. Um, if we go down here, these 83 genes that are changing here are core to every line that we that we measured, and what we see that's consistent in these 83 genes and all of these um, genotypes is that photosynthetic genes show decreased expression in elevated ozone. Ozone, while heat shock proteins and aquaporins increase expression in ozone. And so this gives us some clues into, um, into um, genes that we might alter to improve performance in elevated ozone. Um, and so just to, to summarize the genetic variation in photosynthesis under ozone pollution, what we saw in maize is that there's significant genetic variation and that growth in elevated ozone increased the heritability of photosynthesis in maize. Um, we found that hybrids from parents HP301 and NC338 showed greater sensitivity to ozone stress and disrupted relationships amongst photosynthetic traits. And we also found that the sensitive genotypes couldn't be identified in ambient ozone. So this necessitates screening in elevated ozone. And so this experiment was just to sort of exemplify the work that we're doing, screening for genetic variation in elevated ozone. And as I mentioned before, we're doing similar work in elevated CO2. So over the 20 years of the FACE experiment, we've screened um, hundreds of lines of soybean for um, CO2 response. Um, we've identified two in particular, LODA and HS934118, that have um, very different responses to elevated CO2. So LODA shows a strong yield response on average above 20%, and HS93 really doesn't respond significantly to elevated CO2. We've crossed these lines and developed a recombinant inbred population, and that's what we're screening in the field um, right now. And so if I return to the, to the start of my talk, um, where, where we looked at the trends in temperature and precipitation um, globally over the last 30 years or so, um, we need to think about that in the context of rising CO2 and rising ozone concentrations. And so the scale of our experiments allows us to do drought experiments by using awnings that, we, that can capture um, nighttime rainfall, and also to include infrared heaters where we increase the temperature. Um, and so in these experiments, we can begin to study the interactions between um, greater CO2 and ozone concentrations and enhanced drought um, and also increased temperatures. And what we've learned when we've done the, the interactive experiments is that the benefits and, of growth at elevated CO2 can be diminished or even reversed under high temperature or drought stress. Um, in the warmer years, growth at elevated CO2 does not ameliorate the damaging effects of elevated temperatures. And unfortunately, the interactive effects of elevated CO2 and drought reverse as water becomes increasingly scarce for soybean. And so soy face has been a test bed for investigating crop responses to global change. We've used it in terms of adaptation by screening for diverse lines and identifying the mechanisms of response. Um, we've learned that heat and drought stress can alter the magnitude and direction of soybean yield responses to CO2 and ozone. And this can result in regional variability of crop responses to atmospheric change. Um, we also know there's significant genetic variation in crop responses to ozone, and that provides an opportunity to, pre to prepare crops for the future. Um, and so soy face also provides a test bed for new management practices, because that's another piece uh, of the equation in terms of yield potential that we need to test. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, um, all of the people who, who helped support this experiment from in, in inception. And then in terms of the work that I presented today, I'd like to um, highlight Nicole Choquette, Chris Montes, and Shui Lee.
So I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, really interesting talk. I think especially when we talk about climate change and we talk about some of the future obstacles that will be faced by plants and agriculture in the future, we don't always talk about ozone. So it's really great to get that perspective as well. Um, really briefly, if you have any questions, please place them into the Q&A chat box and we will um, go over them as soon as um, both of the uh, speakers are, are finished presenting. And so with that, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Amanda Cavanaugh. Amanda Cavanaugh is a lecturer at the University of Essex and is a key researcher in the Realizing Increased Photosynthetic Efficiency, or RIPE, project. Her expertise lies in exploring the biochemical diversity of plants and its impact on photosynthesis and growth, especially within the context of elevated temperatures. Amanda's groundbreaking work published in prestigious journals includes a notable achievement in increasing crop growth by 40%. With a background in molecular biology and chemistry, she earned her doctorate from the University of New Brunswick, receiving recognition for her research through grants and awards, including um, being the recipient of the 2021 Rank Prize New Lecture Grant. And so with that, I will hand this over to Amanda. Very excited to hear your talk. Thank you very much, Liana. Thanks so much for giving me the chance to speak um, here today and to, to join the screen with Lisa. Um, and I assume everybody can see this. I'm, I'm good to go. Great. All right, so I'll get started. Um, and what I'm gonna talk to you about today is is a really lovely, or has been really well introduced, of course, by Lisa's fantastic overview of agriculture and photosynthesis and climate change. And I'm really gonna focus on temperature. And um, as opposed to Lisa, I'm gonna take the other side of our sort of solutions toolkit. And instead of talking to you about breeding options and genetic variation, I'll talk to you about some biotech approaches to um, finding a solution to uh, produce more food in a changing climate. And for that, one of the one of the um, starting points here is to modify this really lovely IPCC slide that's talked to us or got us thinking about our choices. And so we know that the choices we make today are deciding our future, whether we will have low to very low or more likely intermediate to very high um, CO2 emission future scenarios, and there are accompanying changes in temperature. And so we can assume that conventional breeding cycles um, are about a 10 to 15 year um, cycle to get an innovation into a commercial product, um, although that's being decreased now with speed breeding advances. But if we think about biotech approaches, we can look at something like golden rice, which um, first entered the research sphere in 1992 and became a commercial, commercial viable product in 2021. So we're looking at about a 30 year pace for realizing increases in biotech approaches. And I think that really highlights to me one of the um, time limiting phases that we're facing right now. So if we wanna think about taking biotech traits into the future to improve crop thermal tolerance, a biotech trait that would be you know, getting into research streams uh, from 2023 is facing a very different future. These are my little um, modified soybean cartoons, if you can't tell, um, is facing a very different future than a biotech trait that starts research um, or starts its life in research in about 2030, right? And so we really have to start thinking about what these mid-century targets are going to look like and then work with people who have wonderful growth facilities like Soyface to try and actually test some of these. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. We know, of course, that temperature is reducing the yields of our major global crops. Um, so this is complementary modeling, not the same that Lisa showed you, but modeling that suggests that each degree Celsius of warming is reducing our yields of our major foodstuffs. So wheat about six degrees loss in yield for every degree Celsius of warming, rice 3.2%, soybean about 3% and maize um, up to seven. And so we know that this is also coming at a time where our rates of um, yield production need to increase. And so right now we're looking at these dashed lines which are giving us our FAO projected yield demands of mid-century. Um, and our solid lines are, are tracking our sort of um, yield improvements year on year. And so we know that we are facing a gap in production. And so the real question that's been driving a lot of my research is whether or not we can improve photosynthesis to improve crop thermal tolerance. And I really believe that we can. And one of the reasons for that is because rising temperatures promote photorespiration. So right now at the screen, you're looking at my favorite enzyme, Rubisco. Rubisco is out there making life on earth possible by fixing a carbon dioxide, which you can see on the left side of your screen, um, to RUBP in the Calvin cycle and maintaining that sort of C3 carbon fixation that feeds us and feeds the world. 
but Rubisco has a side reaction. And about 20% of the time, instead of fixing a CO2, it will fix an oxygen instead. And that process initiates photorespiration. One of the things we know is that photorespiration is promoted by rising temperatures. And photorespiration, although critical for plant you know, viability in our atmosphere, also um, is incredibly energy demanding. So photorespiration after rubisco oxygenation produces glycolate. Glycolate has to be transported out of the chloroplast, which is this green box you're looking at on the left-hand side of the screen. It's transported out of the chloroplast and into the peroxisome. Once in the peroxisome, glycolate's converted to glycine. And then in the mitochondria, glycine to serine conversion releases more CO2. So it releases previously fixed carbon dioxide along this recycling pathway to then return glycerate back into the Calvin cycle. And of course this is necessary, but if we model this, modeling the sort of cost of photorespiration reveals that it actually can reduce grain yield across the Midwest US by about 36% in today's atmosphere. So for those of you who are joining us from outside the Midwest US, like myself, um, right now you're looking at the Great Lakes region and the sort of major, well, we think of this as the major growing region of America. So this is really, um, where we're seeing the, the soy corn rotations. And so a 36% yield loss in this part of the country is substantial and manipulating photorespiration or targeting that is not ever going to, um, to, to relinquish all of this 30%, 36%, but a 5% reduction in photorespiration would be equivalent to about a 68 million bushels of soybean annually. And so it is a really promising target for biotechnology approaches. And so what I'm going to tell you today is a story in three quick parts. First, that manipulating photorespiration can boost yield in a C3 model crop. Then I'll tell you why I think it's a promising target really for improved temperature resilience. And finally, I'll hint towards my current work about whether there's scope to improve rather than totally re-engineer the process. So if we think about manipulating photorespiration, we have to actually stop and consider its role in central metabolism. And so here on the left of this grid, you're looking at a plant grown in normal air, right? So normal atmospheric conditions. A um, wild type plant is growing perfectly fine, but if we look at a plant with impaired photorespiration, it's not growing very well at all. And in fact, we need a high CO2 environment here on the right to rescue that phenotype. And so manipulations to photorespiratory genes result in a high CO2 dependent phenotype. And so we know that purely manipulating photorespiration isn't an option. We can't just knock this process down. However, over the past 15 years, a really promising strategy has been to rewire the process. So instead to install synthetic pathways into plant chloroplasts. And the rationale here, of course, is that you can increase that flux into the alternate pathway. You can increase CO2 within the chloroplast by releasing CO2 at the site of rubisco, and you can reduce the energetic cost of glycolate metabolism. And over the past you know, decade and a half of work, two major synthetic strategies have really emerged. And the first is a glycolate to glycerate conversion, which you can see on the top part of this figure. And in the glycolate to glycerate conversion, we're still returning glycerate to the Calvin Benson cycle. And so you maintain that carbon scavenging portion of photorespiration to recycle intermediates back into C3 metabolism. The other strategy, the glycolate oxidation pathway, does not return intermediates back to the Calvin Benson cycle. And so instead, it's completely oxidizing glycolate within the chloroplast and producing more CO2, albeit theoretically within the chloroplast for rubisco to refix. And if we look at this um, right now, we can just see that these biomass differences have been now found over quite a few species um, since their inception. And so again, we're looking at the glycolate oxidation pathways in the top and the, um, sorry, the glycolate oxidation pathways in the bottom um, and the um, glycolate to glycerate conversion pathways on top. And where you see a dashed line here, um, we're showing that there's no biomass difference relative to wild type. And so your main take home from this is that through model plants like Arabidopsis and tobacco up to actual grain increases in some plantings of um, rice and wheat, we can start to see that these um, manipulations to photorespiration are starting to prove a really promising strategy to increase crop growth and plant yield. And the one we're going to talk about the most is here in purple. So this is the pathway I've been involved in testing and building um, 
uh, designed by my good friend Paul South and published in 2019. And so when we took a look at this pathway, we've called this pathway AP3, alternative pathway three. It was the third one we tested. Um, this pathway was mainly another glycolate oxidation pathway with the benefit of also trying to knock down native photorespiration. And so we, Paul used um, an RNAi module to knock down PLGG1, which is the main glycolate transporter that we knew of at the time in the chloroplast. Um, and the thought was that we would enhance the flux into the alternate pathway rather than into the native pathway. And so the first thing that we would wanna look at is whether or not these actually compared well to, um, or whether or not our PLGG1 RNAi knockdown worked. And so what you're looking at right now is tobacco lines containing PLGG1 RNA interference. So they don't have the PLGG1 transporter and wild type tobacco lines grown in ambient CO2 conditions. And you see again, that stunted photorespiratory phenotype coming through. And when we complemented those plants with the full pathway, so with the rewired photorespiration, what we could see is that the synthetic pathways lowered the cost of photorespiration in controlled environments. And the plants were larger, up to 20 to 30% in controlled conditions. We then took those to the field. And we took them to the field in a um, replicated field trial in 2017, where we found, again, that the plants had increased photosynthetic efficiency. So right now we're looking at plants both with and without that RNAi knockdown of the transporter. So plants that had hypothetically more flux to photorespiration and plants that didn't. And we saw that they had more efficient um, quantum efficiency of photosynthesis, but they also had a higher uh, diurnal rate of carbon fixation compared to their wild type controls. And when we looked at the differences in biomass, we could see of course that they were um, about 20 to 40% larger than their wild type controls. And so we did show, of course, that manipulating photorespiration can boost yield in C3 crops. This has now been demonstrated, again, in some of our major food crops, um, and there's more work ongoing into other ones. Um, but what I really want to talk to you about is something that's a bit near and dearer to our conversation today, and it's why photorespiration is a promising target for improved temperature resilience. And it comes back to, of course, the fact that rising temperatures promote photorespiration because Rubisco is less specific for CO2 as a substrate than oxygen as temperatures rise, we do get more photorespiratory losses that are increasing with temperature. And we can see this again, looking at Berkeley Walker's modeling of losses due to photorespiration. And so if we look at our sort of business as usual, um, climate change projections, which give us um, a, a very high uh, CO2 concentration at the end of the century and about a four, degrees Celsius increase in temperatures, we can see that we haven't eliminated the photorespiratory problem. And so losses are still increasing with temperature, not particularly in the northern growing regions, but certainly in the south, where they are staying around mid 20s to 30% losses. And so the real question we wanted to test was whether or not our synthetic plants, our, plants, our AP plants, would have a thermal protective effect. We thought there was a good reason they would, because when we did the temperature response of photosynthesis, so looking at steady state photosynthesis at ambient conditions um, across a range of growing temperatures, we could see that our plants really demonstrated a benefit once we got north of about 35 degrees Celsius. And so then we took these to the field and we asked whether or not they would offer thermal protection in the field. For those of you who have been paying attention, you'll note this was also work done at Soyface. And so this is a close up of the heaters that Lisa was just talking about. The heaters were a really exciting experiment for me because they let me actually test this in the field. And so we had an ambient and a heated plot side by side in the field. And we had three transgenic um, events or lines along with a single wild type that we randomized throughout the plots. And so the ambient um, plot had an infrared radiometer which allowed us to test canopy temperature throughout the growing season. And that data went back to a data logger that Carl um, very helpfully has set up. Um, and then Carl Bernacki's, sorry, I should mention this was done in collaboration with Carl Bernacki, who's also at the USDA ARS um, in the University of Illinois. Uh, and so that then let us heat our heated canopy up five degrees Celsius relative to the ambient throughout the growing season. And it was using these infrared systems. And so the first thing that we wanted to do was make sure that our average temperature differential was consistent. We did this twice throughout a single growing season to get our replication. We could see, of course, that our 
temperature was spot on close to five degrees Celsius throughout the growing season. Um, the next thing we did was took a look at our sort of hallmarks of increased photosynthesis in these plants. And so we looked again at the diurnal responses of photosynthesis, which is where we go out with our um, our, our measurements um, and we measure throughout the course of the growing season. And what we saw before, I'm showing you the previous data that we saw in our original field trials, was that particularly at midday, there wasn't a lot of difference between our plants and their wild type controls. So you're looking at transgenic lines here in the color and wild type sort of in gray below. But when we looked in the afternoon, we could see that these transgenic plants did have a benefit relative to the wild type to maintain enhanced photosynthesis throughout the day. And over the course of the growing season, we, we theorized that this would have a benefit akin to a compound interest. And so we hypothesized that under heat, that benefit would hold. And in our first experiment, that's what we saw, but we only saw it under heat. And so in our ambient conditions, right now we're looking at ambient conditions in solid, heated conditions in our um, sort of slashed conditions here, our ambient conditions, we didn't see a difference between our transgenics and our wild types, but in our heated plots, we did. When we looked at our second round of this, we actually saw differences between our transgenics and our controls throughout all treatments, but we didn't see a heating difference. And I think if we look back to this, this really highlights what we're here to talk about today and the, the sort of integration of improvement strategies with climate change and um, climate differences. So if we take a look back at when we measured these, in our first round, our plants have been planted in the field and then really went through this period of cooling. And then we measured essentially cool developed leaves. However, in our second round of measurements, all of the leaves had really developed in an extreme heating condition in the field the two weeks prior. And so we again theorize that our alternative pathway or bypassing photorespiration is really only beneficial to us under heat stress. So in the cool developed leaves, we see this benefit under heat stress, but in the hot developed leaves, we see that pathway benefit under both conditions. And when we sort of look at this or summarize this over the growing season, we see again that the alternative pathway did lower the cost of growth at elevated temperature. What you're looking at right now is relative changes to the ambient biomass. We see that heated relative to ambient in wild type results in a loss of about 30% of potential biomass, whereas our heated um, transgenic lines lose about 20 to 15% of their total biomass. And so they really are maintaining higher, um, higher growth rates under that extreme heat in the field. And so we know, of course, that it improves growth in our model crop, but it also really improves growth under those higher photorespiratory conditions and can minimize the losses due to warming. But I'll just finish with this idea that we've been pondering for a while now that I've started a lab here at the University of Essex about whether or not there's scope to improve rather than totally re-engineer the process of photorespiration. And so photorespiration consists of nine enzymatic steps over three organelles. And there's a lot of ways that this process has been integrated with plant secondary metabolism. For example, we know that plants can actually increase CO2 assimilation by increasing nitrogen assimilation via photorespiration. And so the question we're asking is whether or not increased flux can be a good thing. There's definitely evidence to suggest that it is. And some of this best work comes from both Stefan Tim and now, my now colleague, Christine Rains here at the University of Essex. And so overexpression of the glycine cleavage system, where we're actually converting that glycine to serine, in the mitochondria, you can see down here. So overexpressing a component of this system leads to increases in biomass, electron transport, and CO2 assimilation in Arabidopsis. But I think what's really interesting, if you go back and look at this data as it was reported, is that the biomass increases relative to controls are actually enhanced under high light growth conditions relative to low light growth conditions. And high light conditions are a high photorespiratory stress condition for Arabidopsis. We can also see that once this has been moved to tobacco, as Patricia Lopez Calcano did when she was a postdoc with Christine Rains, um, that this overexpression of the glycine cleavage system again drives increases in biomass in tobacco of 30 to 45 percent relative to controls. And this is again field grown conditions, which are higher photorespiratory conditions. And so we've started taking a look at this, um, looking again at photosynthesis as our guide to see whether or not we could see a temperature effect. 
And it's very much early days yet, but if we look at glycine overexpressors or glycine conversion overexpressors here in green versus wild type in gray, we can see that if we're monitor monitoring this at about 26 degrees Celsius, we don't see differences in ambient photosynthesis between the two genotypes. But as we start again, moving up into higher temperature conditions like 31 degrees Celsius, we do see that these overexpressors of photorespiration are maintaining slightly higher rates of photosynthesis. And so will it impact growth? I would say watch this space. And because of course, we need facilities to be able to let us actually do this. So it's not that I'm going to be able to send my plants to the USDA to measure under field heating trials all the time, though I wish I could. Um, and coming soon at the University of Essex is our Wolfson Smart Technological Experimental Plant Suite. So we are not able to grow transgenic plants readily in the field here in the UK, but it is crucial that we start testing these viable strategies. One way to do that, of course, is to do this inside. And so what we will have is our indoor field opening this spring, which will have a data logger that we can pair with any field site and then start to manipulate temperature, light, humidity in real time so that we can start to mimic a field before we have good reasons to put these out. And this is really a brainchild of my wonderful colleague, Professor Tracy Lawson, but I can't resist this wonderful, um, you know, uh, Charlie's Angels pose that I forced her to do. And so if this excites you, and I hope it did, I just also want to highlight that we're recruiting two new postdocs at Essex to work with us on improving photosynthesis. So the ad is live now. If you can't find it, please do um, email me or send me a message either on the you know space formerly known as Twitter or Blue Sky, where you can find me as Cavi Cavs. And I will also say thanks to everyone. Um, I've been working in a really great team for a very long time and I'm really lucky. So especially thank you to Dr. Ali Leverett, who's now moved on to a position at Cambridge and Kamel Chabani, who've been wonderful postdocs in my group. Um, and my collaborators, of course, at the University of Illinois, Don Ort, where I did all of my postdoc work, um, Carl Bernacki and Dr. Paul South. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that talk um, and the perspectives, especially related to elevated temperatures. Um, it's been really great to listen to. So with that, we're going to start shifting into the Q&A portion of this session. We have a bunch of uh, questions already in the Q&A chat box. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to submit them here. I'll be looking at them and seeing if I can uh, put some of them together, if there's some that are um, related. But I think what's great is that a lot of these questions can be answered by both of you. Um, so I guess just to get started, I'm going to start at the top and then we'll work through it. So um, there's been a few questions related to the impact of elevated CO2 on perhaps mitigating some of the effects that we see in plants um, due to climate change. Um, so question from Devansh uh, Diani, with the increasing CO2 concentrations, what is the importance of rubisco modification uh, for this time period? So I think... Amanda or Lisa, whoever would like to take this question. Amanda, it's all yours. Sure. Um, so I think it's interesting with the increasing CO2 concentrations, right? We know that as CO2 increases, um, the sort of rubisco problem of a, a confused substrate specificity should be less of an issue. However, modeling suggests that photorespiration continues to be an issue. Therefore, Rubisco specificity continues to be an issue. I think this is going to be coupled with the fact that we also know as plants grow in high CO2 conditions, they produce less rubisco. And so they they start to downregulate that rubisco production um, on a leaf area basis. And normally the CO2 fertilization is enough to allow them to maintain high rates of photosynthesis. But as Lisa said, when we look at this in a sort of synergistic perspective with drought and changes in temperature, that balance can shift a little bit. I'm not sure if that really answers the question. Um, the importance of rubisco modification, um, I'm not sure, sorry. Lisa, do you okay. want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's still an opportunity, as Amanda said, with higher temperatures and so as CO2 increases, temperatures are going to go up. As temperatures go up, then the efficiency of the enzyme also is lower. So regardless of what the CO2 concentrations are, the fact that it's a bifunctional enzyme mean that there's an opportunity there um, to enhance its efficiency. And I think, Lisa, would you be able to follow up on that? Because there's been a lot of questions here about the impact of um, elevated temperatures on photosynthesis. Right. Um, 
maybe we yeah. can knock out a few of those questions related to okay. that. Right. Yeah. And so um, all plant species are going to have an optimal um, temperature for which photosynthesis, CO2 assimilation is optimal, above which there's le there's lower CO2 assimilation and below which there's lower CO2 assimilation. So if we think about the maps of where warming has occurred, some of those, some of that warming is going to mean that plants are closer to their optimum um, temperature for photosynthesis. And so global warming will have, in fact, increased their, um, their CO2 assimilation um, and the net primary productivity of those ecosystems. In other places, the warming is meant that we're now above the temperature optimum of photosynthesis. And so in those places, then that primary productivity is going down and will continue to go down as temperatures increase. Um, and so it's, it, you know, the, the question is very context dependent. It's dependent on the species and it's dependent on the ecosystem. And in that regard, I think that's why some studies show that CO2 can protect from stresses and other studies show that it doesn't protect from stresses because when we apply a temperature treatment or a drought treatment, the degree of that treatment is variable. And so whether an interaction is having a beneficial or a negative effect is going to depend upon um, the, the baseline um, conditions. And so, you know, our control condition at soy face has also changed tremendously over the last 20 years. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind when we're trying to interpret the climate change studies that have been done. Great. Thank you. And I think that actually answers a, a few of the questions that have been in the chat box right now, especially that interaction between CO2 and temperature and, and why we might not see those differences in every single study that comes out. Um, related to, to that question, there's another question here from Dr. Jui uh, Bhattacharya, who asked uh, how other organelles besides the chloroplast um, respond to increased temperature. So I guess processes within the cell that could be um, affected. I know that you alluded to heat shock proteins um, in, in some of your work. Or Amanda, if you'd like to comment on that. Or either of <laughs> you, I don't know. <laughs> Sure. I think the obvious one to me is respiration from the mitochondria, right? So if we think about mitochondrial respiration, um, that increases really rapidly with temperature, meaning that we're we're getting that CO2 release um, rapidly increasing with temperature. Um, and we don't have that same thermal or decline above the thermal optima that we tend to see in photosynthesis. And so that, that increase is exponential. Um, and so I think to me, from my perspective, that's one of the most important ones. To be honest, I don't know a lot about what's going on in the paroxysm with respect to temperature stresses, but I will assume that Lisa might have some insight from ozone pollution. Yeah, I mean, respiration also tends to go up and they're elevated ozone. And one of the hypotheses is there it's needed for detoxification reactions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, right, there, you know, um, I guess Amanda and I both study photosynthesis. So we kind of think about chloroplasts and in a vacuum, I guess, but certainly respiration um, in, in, in soybean respiration increases in elevated CO2. It also increases with elevated temperature and it increases with ozone. Um, in other species, an increase in respiration has not been so clearly documented in elevated CO2. So kind of related to that, we have a question from Gary Bradbury who asks, what are the current realities of the actual ozone concentrations in major crop growing regions? Are the concentrations at those high levels only in the locations which are downwind of major city areas or do they even out quickly? Yeah, so it's ozone is a dynamic pollutant. And so it's not like CO2 where it's pretty constantly increasing in the atmosphere. It's a dynamic pollutant that um, a molecule of ozone in the troposphere only sticks around for a few weeks. Um, and so that said, you know, you do have local hot spots for ozone, um, ozone production, but the precursor um, pollutants are also increasing and they're increasing across the globe. And so in places in the, in the, in Western Europe and in the United States, there's been strong controls on, um, um, on nitrogen release from, from emissions. And so that has, that has led to, you know, that has slowed the increase in ozone or led to stabilization of ozone pollution in some of those regions. Um, but in, in India and in China and now in parts of Africa, concentrations of ozone are continuing to increase. And so, as I said, it's dynamic diurnally, it's dynamic seasonally. So peak concentrations occur in the summer um, when it's warm and dry, 
And then under colder conditions, the the atmospheric reactions that that um, result in ozone production um, are 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 um, slower, and so you get less uh, ozone production in the winter months. Um, so unfortunately, ozone concentrations, especially in India um, and in parts of of China, are are very high and having a very negative impact on crop productivity. Thank you. So I have two questions for Amanda here that um, I think are a little bit related. So the first one is from Dina Karen Alango, who asks, is there any natural variation for AP3 and C3? Is this something that you can find naturally? Um, if so, what might that look like? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, but no, there's no variation for that because it's an entirely synthetic pathway. And so the pathway doesn't exist in nature um, and was sort of created to solve the problem of how you could metabolize glycolate within the chloroplast. Um, so it's not possible for us to look for variation for that pathway in a natural setting. Plants are very unlikely to have it. Um, but I think I know where the second question is coming from then, Liana. Um, but go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to ask from, from uh, actually from Bethany Holland, who asks if manipulating photorespiration um, can affect growth under drought conditions. I don't know if that was what you were thinking, but uh, no, that isn't. But I guess um, that's that was also a good one. Right. So, yes, I think it can. Um, and I think it's likely to. So under drought conditions, plants respond by closing their somata, um, which results in a lowering of the sort of CO2 concentration at the site of rubisco and promoting photorespiration. And so under those conditions, we would expect the plants to have a benefit. Um, we just didn't design a good drought experiment to actually test this. Turns out that's quite complicated. Um, and I have been paying a lot of attention to temperature and not a lot of attention to how you actually do a drought study. So I wish I had a better answer than that, but that's the that's why it wasn't done. Okay, thank you. Um, Amanda, do you want to talk about what, I guess, what you sure. thought the next question I had just sort of scanned the questions and I saw another person asking, you know, why the switch to, um, to looking to manipulating the native photorespiratory pathway. Um, and the biotechnological reason for that. And the reason for that is that we can't find mineable variation in synthetic pathways of photorespiration. They don't exist. But um, within the, the native photorespiratory pathway, I think there, there is possibly some room for looking for exploitable variation and also looking for solutions that are amenable to gene editing approaches rather than transgenic approaches, right? We know that that's becoming a more palatable solution to a lot of governments and policymakers around the world. And so if we're serious about getting actual solutions into fields, that's one way to do it. Thank you. I now have a question, uh, let me try to combine, from Sujata Bhargava and also from Devon Stiani, related to, if, if you both could speak on the role of elevated CO2 on uh, nutrition or how nutritious um, the yield or the product that, that um, crops produce. Right. So there have been some pretty high profile papers that have shown that there are decreases in zinc and iron content when you grow crops under elevated CO2. Um, and these are decreases on the order of 5% when you're increasing CO2 concentration to say 550 parts per million. Um, and so um, for populations that get their nutrients primarily through eating grains um, and seeds and plants, and this is this has the potential to um, decrease uh, nutrition. Um, there's also genetic variation in this response, and so there are lines that don't show the decreases in these nutrient content at elevated CO2. Um, and so again, I think that there's a role for selection there of lines that can maintain that productivity. When you combine elevated CO2 and temperature, high temperature, one of the things that was published recently, at least in soybean, is that you did not see an, a decrease then in zinc and iron content. Um, and so, um, you know, all of these are complex pathways. Um, and so, while elevated CO2 on its own may decrease um, may decrease nutrient content, when you add in other stresses, that may not be the case. Thank you. So we have a bunch of questions here, um, which is great. Um, a lot of engagement on yeah on the talks, and clearly, I think very much enjoyed. So I'm again going to try to combine some of these questions here. So we have from Edward Smith asking if 
the different approaches that you, Lisa, and Amanda can be combined in the future. So, for example, could biotechnological biotechnological approaches have bigger impacts in the right wild type background? And what would the limitations be here? I can also imagine that it depends if you have a cultivar of interest, what genotype you put it into is going to matter a lot. Um, but if you'd like to speak to that. Amanda, you should go ahead. Sure. Um, okay, I was nodding along because yes, that's exactly the the important thing to get right when you're doing biotechnological work. So you can't just fire it into any background. You want to try to find one that's growing in the regions that you're interested in, in targeting, um, but also that is optimized for our sort of current growing practices and, and cultivation practices. And so uh, the work I presented is in a model tobacco crop because it was a proof of concept work. But the important thing now is getting this into a a high yielding, high performing variety that farmers would grow in their field of something like soybean or something like, you know, if you're improving wheat, something like wheat, um, and then seeing if you still see a benefit or is your benefit, you know, not doing anything compared to what generations of breeding improvement has already done. Right? And I think that's key for us, especially people who are approaching this as I am from very much a an enzyme focused or biotech focused perspective to keep in mind that there are people out there who are making great strides, improving yields by breeding and by what we would think of as conventional approaches. And it's important to make sure we're mindful of that and, and get these into the right sort of genetic lines to take forward. But I'm sure Lisa has a more elegant way to say that or add that. No, I, I completely agree. I, I think the challenge is is what Amanda just said, and that is transformation of many of our best lines um, is difficult. And it's um, sometimes, uh, you know, and fantastic transformation facilities aren't present at every university. You know, they're not right at everybody's door. And especially if you think about in um, in developing nations, you know, that that capability is a limitation to combining these approaches. Thank you. Um, so another uh, set of combined questions here, this is a little bit more general, but it would be wonderful to hear your perspectives on how we can incorporate more sustainable agriculture and whether that could look like the role of, I don't know, agroforestry or the use of algae um, in these kinds of systems to work to a more um, sustainable future and also limiting, helping limit emissions um, from agriculture. So I know that that's pretty, uh, wide, but trying to combine a few different questions that are in the chat here. So I think we need to approach all agriculture and climate change and productivity and climate change with an open mind and um, every solution that we can throw at it, we should try to throw at it. I think we're past the point of, of no return. And so um, I don't think that, you know, the, the approaches that Amanda and I talked about today, you know, identifying genetic variation and then trying to tap into that potential biotechnological um, strategies for improving yield and elevated CO2 or in high temperatures or in, under drought stress. Those are all things that, that we should be doing in addition to everything else that we can possibly do. I think we need to reduce emissions and that is obviously not easy. If it were easy, it'd be done. We need to reduce emissions. We need to capture CO2. We need to have more efficient and more sustainable agricultural management practices. And we need to test those practices in the world that, we're, that we anticipate for the future. Um, and, and we need to do all of it, so. Thank you. Amanda, is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, any thoughts? No, I think it's a... You hit the mark, Lisa. I think I totally agree. And these approaches are not, you know, unique to just improving crops, right? So the the bypass work I talked about has now been modified by a biotech startup company to to be involved in direct carbon capture um by manipulating by manipulating trees. And so using trees to to sequester more CO2. Whether or not that works is is the question. They're testing it now. Um, but I think these types of audacious some would say, certainly where I'm based right now in the UK, very American perspectives of how we're going to solve this crisis are at this point necessary. We need to start being a bit optimistic and a bit audacious in our plans. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question here that to summarize is asking about the role of soil microbiome and the impact that that might have as it relates to thermal tolerance. Um, 
would you both be able to speak to that or have any any thoughts on it? I mean, I, all I can say is that the microbiome is definitely um, affected by all elements of climate change and whether or not we can control it or manipulate it in a way that will enhance crop produ production at high temperatures. I think um, that's definitely an audacious goal, as Amanda just said. I think, I don't know that we have the capability to do that at, you know, at least in a field right now where you have millions of other, billions of other microbes that are also present. Yeah, I agree. I'm not um, a microbiome researcher, uh, but I'm starting to find it much more fascinating as as the current work gets out there. And I think we know there's a direct relationship between plants, um, a brusculal microfungi relationships or their um, their soil microbiota relationships, right? That can upregulate photosynthesis. Whether or not that would hold in times of temperature stress, I guess, would depend on how stressful the temperature is um, and and how it's impacting that sort of that below ground microbiome. Um, like Lisa said, I don't think it's really readily applicable at a field scale yet, um, but I do think it's something that we have to be aware of, right? So think about if you're testing things at multiple locations, then you're going to have very different soil communities. And for someone who started thinking about this work from the perspective of the chloroplast and the leaf, uh, that blew my mind a little bit. So it's another interaction that, <laughs> yeah, we have to be pretty mindful of. Yeah, and I think that really speaks to how important to try to address these problems. Interdisciplinary collaborative approaches are going to be essential to be able to solve these big problems and answer these really big questions. And especially, as you mentioned, if we want to have these audacious solutions, we really need to start working across with people at all levels of um, agriculture and also plant science. Um, I think I'm going to be a little bit selfish. I'm going to ask two questions um, that I have on my mind. The first is for Lisa. So I was really curious about the uh, increase in heritability under elevated ozone, um, especially because in other studies under abiotic stress, you might see a decrease, sometimes an increase, but it's really all over the place. Do you know why that increase might be occurring for these plants? I, well, I think in this, in the case of our study, there were those two parent lines that really had um, a strong effect on whether those in our um population it was responding to ozone and so um the other thing that ozone does is it is as you saw it decreased photosynthesis in some lines quite dramatically and others it didn't have a response and that increased sort of the um the inference space of our trait which you know i think is a non-biological reason that you can it's a mathematical reason that you can have that increase in heritability um but i, I think we we you know, we identified two lines that were particularly sensitive and then when crossed with any of those other lines and that then increased the heritability of the trait overall. Okay, thank you. And then my other question, which is for both of you, um, and this is something that's been more on my mind recently, but thinking about the role of increased night temperatures, is that something that you both are also starting to think about more moving forward um, or of interest? We know that there's been some studies that have really focused in maybe in major grain crops looking at um, increased night temperature, but not so much outside of that. Um, not sure if you both would like to speak on that. I think it's fascinating, Liana, but it's not an area I ventured into on purpose. I will say we accidentally did it because I didn't program the heaters to go off at night. And so the heating experiment work I showed you um, did include a nighttime heating um, onto that. But I mean, I think some of the things I've read seem to suggest that it's really the nighttime temperatures for a crop like wheat, at least that's, that's really coming for us. Right. So it's, it's that. And so, so I don't have a personal stake in the game. It's not work I'm working on, but I think it's critically important. And I think it probably comes back to the, from a physiology perspective, the respiration, um, the relationship of respiration with temperature, right? So you're heating up the plant at night and you're increasing that nighttime respiration component. Um, and Lisa, uh, have something to say from, you know, decades of work at Soyface on what you've seen? Right, I mean, we haven't we haven't studied it um, by manipulating temperatures at night specifically, but, um, you know, Soyface now has 20 years of data where you can look at the impacts of, of you can, you know, you have, 
um, plenty of nighttime temperature data. And, and also just thinking more broadly about the availability of data to look at um, uh, about recent changes in climate and temperature and how they have impacted productivity. I think we're in an age where we can learn a lot from the data that are being collected by satellites, by USDA across at least the United States and by other agencies, the Food and Agricultural Organization to look at some of these questions. And then sort of taking off the photosynthesis hat, you know, temper nighttime temperature has a big impact on flowering and um, also on pollen viability um, in, in some species. And so, yeah, it is absolutely critically important. Thank you. So we just have a few more questions left here, uh, but Devanciani asks, what kind of challenges should farmers be preparing for uh, with increased levels of CO2, um, especially as this might relate to developing countries? I think the challenge is going to be resilience, personally, and I think that's a really hard one to prepare for. How do you prepare for the unexpected? How do you prepare for the fact that you know, several parts of your country flooded this year, but next year you're going to bake due to increased temperature. Um, and for that, I think the answer might lie with policymakers. And, and it certainly isn't one I have a good answer to, but I think it's resilience in... And Lisa, do you have a... Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think there is, there are always going to be variable growing seasons, right? And so anything that farmers can do to either have, um, um, you know, to not be completely dependent upon one crop every year, you know, anything like that, that will increase their economic sustainability as well as sort of the the um, agronomic sustainability of their crops, I think is something to start thinking about. Um, and as Amanda said, this is very complicated. That create that means that there has to be a market that a farmer in a developing country can be part of. And so it's, it's not just about plant productivity. It's also about access. Thank you. And then to start wrapping up a little bit. So we have a question from Sujata Bhargava, who um, I guess this is a little bit related to this um, well, hold on, I'll just ask the question. So if you both could speak to the relationship of high temperature, which promotes dark respiration, um, but also promotes photosynthetic rates and how these two opposites affect yield, opposite effects, excuse me. Yeah, I think it comes back to um, the really great point Lisa made earlier about the temperature optimum, right? So when you are operating above the thermal optimum for photosynthesis, the increases in temperature are going to be detrimental. So it's not going to be increasing photosynthetic rate any longer, but you are increasing respiration rate. And if you are operating in a, in a cool growing region or below the thermal optimum for your crop, those increases in temperature are going to increase photosynthesis. And yes, increase respiration, but increase photosynthetic CO2 assimilation into its optimal range. And so there's not really a a single solution for this um, or a one size fits all. It's really dependent on the species you're looking at and the condition it's growing in. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have another question here, which I think is speaking towards the difference between short-term and long-term heat stress. Um, where um, the question is small increase in temperature is more dangerous to crop yield as compared to, I guess, long-term heat stress, whether or not this is um, true, or maybe what are some of the caveats versus a shorter heat-term stress versus a longer um, heat stress? Sure. I think a major caveat is the timing of the heat stress. So again, a plant is much more than a collection of leaves. Shocking to me. But there are a lot more processes happening or occurring at the same time as photosynthesis, right? Photosynthesis just happens to be what I care about the most. And so long-term heat stress might give a plant the opportunity to acclimate to its new growing environment, whereas a short but really significant portion of heat stress um, means the plant hasn't had a chance to acclimate. And if that intense period of heat stress is severe, that could have ramifications. The other issue is timing. So is it happening when a plant is just experiencing vegetative growth or is your heat stress occurring 
when a plant is starting to enter a reproductive phase, because we know that that's going to have huge impacts on yield, right? Photosynthesis is, of course, the most important reaction on the planet, but in terms of yield, flowering, um, flowering phases, reproductive phases, pollen and seed set are actually crucial and they're very temperature labile. So if our temperature stress is hitting us then, then a plant is going to be impacted much differently than if it's getting a bunch of heat stress early in the season. So I think you've got to really consider the timing of your stress and the duration of your stress, not just whether or not you have a short temperature stress or a long one. And sometimes whether water is available is going to make a big difference too. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think we, we answered this question before with what I'd mentioned about nighttime temperature, um, but just to reiterate, um, so I guess the question is, studies show that increasing night temperature has more of a detrimental effect on yield than day temperature. Um, don't know if we want to go back into that or uh, I think it is really crop dependent. Um, at least what I've seen in wheat, it seems to be very uh, genotype dependent, very crop dependent and doesn't seem to be consistent across the board. So in some crops, it, it'll definitely be a, a much bigger impact. Um, but I think it also very much depends on adding to this body of information that is still quite limited relative to what we know during uh, the day. Is anyone else that would like to answer or add anything else? Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's anything I could bring to this conversation that will add to what you have to say on nocturnal <laughs> temperature. Liana, we'll let you answer that one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so I think that we don't have any questions as now, and, and I know it's just been a barrage of, of questions, and uh, so we really appreciate um, you both answering all of them and, and really uh, leading such a great discussion on this topic that is really important, um, really, of course, relevant. Um, so with that, if there's no any other questions, um, I think we'll start to wrap everything up and spare you for more questions. <laughs> but um, what we'd like to mention is that we're going to have one more webinar, which will be this Wednesday, um, where we have a speaker from, whoosh, I should know this, uh, one moment, where we'll have a speaker, uh, Mark yeah, Tesser so from, oops, sorry, go ahead. Hello, I just wanted to, say, uh, to tell you that it's in the chat. So, uh, Next webinar will be on Wednesday. It will be very early in the morning for the people in Europe, and it will be uh, probably an appropriate time for the people in Asia and, and in the Pacific. Um, so it will be, we will have two speakers, uh, Mark Tester from Kaust, and also Rob Allen from, from, from Australia, from, um, how, how is it called? I would say Cyro, yeah. Cyro. Okay, and uh, they will talk about pioneering plant science for sustainable future. So that will be uh, seven in the morning here in Europe and probably another time where you are all <laughs> because I've seen people from all around the world <laughs> right uh, right now in the in the in the room. So we will uh, welcome you on Wednesday if you are up to it. Yep. And we want to say thank you so much for everyone who has attended. Um, it's been really great being able to interact with so many people. Um, please keep an eye out on other Global Plant Council happenings, initiatives. Um, and if you would like to access this, all this is being recorded. So you can check this out for posterity as well. Or if you can't attend in person uh, the webinar this Wednesday, then that's something that you can check out later. Mm -hmm. So with that, I think that that's it, right? That's yeah. it. Great. Well, thank you. So everyone take care and, and thanks so much for your participation. Bye-bye, everyone.